Okay, I've been given the word that now it's the time to proceed. Um, my name is Brett Asbury. I am a professor um, here at the Klein School of Law. And um, here to introduce the panel, I will not do too much introduction because you have their bios in your program and we are here to see them and not me. Um, we're gonna go in the following order, uh, Professor Kukura first, and then Mari Carmen Farmer, then Emily Reyes, and then Robbie Davis Floyd, followed by Indra Wood Lucero. Professor Kukur will kick us off, like I said, and she'll give a <clears throat> presentation about how COVID has changed the mother baby friendly practices of institutions and have undermined um, health and autonomy. Mari Carmen Pharma, she's a doula, midwife and educator. She have a paper about um, three lessons from COVID. One, um, the relationship between structural racism and health disparity, sorry about that. Two, um, the importance of centering the patient in healthcare decision-making. And three, the essentiality of pro providing the most choice and collaboration in providing healthcare. Third will be Emmeline Reyes, a PhD candidate at Temple. She will present her work about um, um, observations made during the pandemic with respect to birth in Puerto Rico. Uh, Robbie Davis Floyd is a professor um, of anthropology. Uh, she'll give a paper about how COVID has made the need for decentralized maternal care more essential than ever before. And then finally, uh, Andrew Wood Lucero, a practitioner from Colorado, will give her paper about some lessons from COVID um, with respect to perinatal care, focusing on four areas. One, human rights. Two, risk. Three, points of connection and disconnection. And four, inexpensive and efficient options in providing perinatal health. Uh, so I'll kick it off to Liz. I didn't say Liz is a colleague and friend of mine from the Drexel Klein School of Law, and I look forward to hearing what you guys have to say. Great. Thanks so much, Brett. Um, and good morning, everybody. Um, thank you for joining us today. And thank you to the Law Review editors um, for all their work putting together today's event. Um, so I'm pleased to be starting off this session on pregnancy and childbirth during COVID. And what I'd like to do with my time is to kind of briefly identify several trends that we've seen over the last year and a half. Um, trends, which I think some of the other panelists will then address with greater nuance, um, and then just consider briefly some potential implications as we, we look ahead. The developments I'll discuss have um, highlighted or exacerbated existing problems within maternity care in the US. Like so many features of life during the pandemic, these problems have become more acute um, and more consequential under COVID. Uh, and I think importantly for our conversation today, the experiences of childbearing people during the pandemic paint a fairly stark picture about the precariousness of rights in childbirth and, and the fragility of certain hard-won reforms that have aimed um, uh, in recent years and recent decades to improve the quality of maternity care services. Professor so first Kukur, I want to lay a, a foundation about what Professor birth in this Kukur, country... Yeah. May I for one, I'm sorry, I, I, I didn't say we want to keep these um, presentations limited to about 14 minutes tops. I know... Um, some of the earlier talks went a little bit longer, but we want to make sure that we abide by that. I'm, I'm going to be strict and I apologize in advance for doing so. Okay, but I get that 10 seconds back from you. So absolutely. <laughs> um, thanks for thanks for keeping us on, on track, Brett. Um, so first I'm just gonna lay a quick foundation about what birth in this country looks like in non-pandemic times, because I think that can help us see where the response to COVID-19 has particularly impacted childbirth policies and the experiences of birthing people. Um, so a couple key features about childbirth in the United States. The vast majority of pregnant people who give birth um, uh, in the US give birth with an obstetrician as their care provider. Although family medicine physicians and midwives also receive specialized training in childbirth. Of the approximately 4 million people who give birth every year, about 90% of them deliver with a physician and about 10% deliver with a midwife, which is a really different breakdown um, than many of our peer nations, where midwives are the primary providers uh, of maternity care for uncomplicated pregnancies. Of those 4 million or so births, 98% take place in a hospital, with the remainder occurring in community settings like freestanding birth centers or in a private home. Almost all of those community births take place with a midwife as an attendant. Although there's an increasing recognition that the midwifery model of care uh, with its holistic non-interventionist approach 
offer some important health benefits. Midwives face restrictions on their practice that limits the growth of midwifery as a profession. Um, and this is especially troubling against the sort of backdrop of an obstetrics workforce shortage that is projected to increase dramatically um, uh, in the coming decades. Because not all insurance covers community birth and not all parts of the country have birth centers or have access to direct entry midwives, there are significant barriers to accessing this kind of care for people who can't afford to pay out of pocket or who live outside major metropolitan areas. And importantly, about 40% of all births are covered by Medicaid, which um, certainly shapes how and from whom pregnant people obtain their care. Um, as physicians, sort of became the dominant providers of childbirth, birth itself has become increasingly medicalized. Approximately 32% of babies are born by cesarean, um, uh, and nearly half of people delivering for the first time have their labor artificially induced. It's rare that somebody delivering in a hospital gives birth without some form of medical intervention. Uh, and in many instances, there are multiple interventions, not all of which are medically necessary in every circumstance. It's clear that this orientation towards intervention has not disrupted the maternal mortality crisis that we're currently experiencing, with the US reporting the highest rate of maternal deaths in the developed world, which disproportionately impacts Black women, as well as low-income women, rural women, and non-Black women of color. And then finally, we know that an increasing number of women are reporting mistreatment at the hands of their healthcare providers, um, including uh, coercion to consent to unwanted treatment, unconsented vaginal exams, physical restraint, dehumanizing language, or unconsented surgeries like cesareans or episiotomies. And research suggests that people of color, low-income people, and young people disproportionately encounter coercion and other forms of mistreatment by their healthcare providers during childbirth. Okay, so when the country ground to a halt in March 2020, what was the impact on pregnant people? A um, couple things I want to highlight. One important development was a new wave of visitor restrictions that limited who could accompany a pregnant person during labor and delivery. In their most extreme form, this meant some people, especially in New York, gave birth without their partners or any loved one by their side. More common were policies that allowed only one companion for a laboring person, which meant a spouse or partner could be present, but not a birth doula or other support person. Why does this matter? Well, we have good evidence that continuous emotional and physical support during labor and delivery, the type provided by birth doulas in their non-medical role, is associated with good things, shorter labors, less reliance on pain medication, fewer interventions, including fewer cesareans. Doulas help birthing people and often their partners navigate unfamiliar terrain in the hospital and help them advocate for themselves. This is especially important for people with a history of trauma, whether um, from a prior birth or due to sexual assault. Support for self-advocacy is particularly important in the face of bias within healthcare institutions that research shows results in Black women's symptoms often being ignored and their pain being poorly managed. Because Black women and other pregnant people of color experience mistreatment at disproportionately high rates, the lack of doula support can compound experiences of disempowerment, alienation, and trauma, which in turn can interfere with the health and well being uh, of both mother and infant. So, in some jurisdictions, mobilization among birth advocates resulted in state level executive orders classifying doulas as an essential part of the care support team who must be allowed to accompany a birthing person uh, in addition to a partner or other loved one. But the fact that it was even necessary to obtain this extraordinary relief in order for birthing people to have basic forms of support during childbirth is a reflection of how little we understand and value the needs of pregnant people. Another development that I wanted to mention uh, was that hospitals began separating newborns from their parents after a positive or suspected positive COVID-19 result due to concern about maternal infant virus transmission. This was a departure from evidence about uh, the importance of early skin to skin contact for bonding, for breastfeeding success, for newborn temperature regulation, and for decreased maternal and infant stress levels. And it also undermined years of advocacy about the benefits of keeping newborns and parents together during the postpartum period. So initially, in the early weeks and months, there was a conflict between the guidance uh, of the American Academy of Pediatrics and the CDC, both of which recommended separation uh, following the approach that Chinese authorities had taken, and the WHO, which supported keeping newborns with their parents while using mask wearing and hand washing to minimize risk. Throughout this time, parents retained the right to decline separation, but not all hospitals informed patients of this right 
or explained the conflicting expert guidance, the lack of data about vertical transmission of the virus, and the evidence about the benefits of early contact. And this reflects the types of variation we see in informed consent practices from hospital to hospital and among individual providers. Um, and also in the uneven adherence to evidence-based practices more generally in maternity care, even in non-pandemic times. And troublingly, disagreement about newborn separation policies left room for discretion in how such policies were applied, which allowed in some instances for bias to influence decision-making. At least one hospital has been discovered to have had a secret policy of profiling on racial and ethnic grounds under which they conducted COVID screenings based on whether patients appeared to be Native American and then routinely separated them from their newborns without consent. In addition to restrictions on birth support and these newborn separation policies, advocacy groups have documented increased reporting of mistreatment by healthcare providers during childbirth since the emergence of COVID-19, including the use of unwanted and medically unnecessary interventions. So this includes uh, pressure to consent to certain interventions that might be used to accelerate labor and delivery, such as uh, induction or cesarean surgery, denial of access to other requested interventions, or hospital prohibitions on videotaping or streaming um, used as a way to limit patient access to virtual doula support. Altogether, these changes in childbirth policies and practices had devastating implications for many childbearing people during this period, both in terms of the physical health of birthing people and their babies, and in terms of the psychological impact of such measures on overall well-being. Now, of course, it would be hard to overstate the fear and uncertainty that shaped decision-making early in the pandemic when limited knowledge about how the virus even spread and lack of access to adequate PPE drove risk calculations for hospitals and providers. But as some of these practices have persisted as the pandemic continues, I think it's important to take a closer look at what they might tell us about childbirth in this country more generally and what we can expect um, or hope for in the future. So what might we make of some of these developments um, and their potential longer term impacts? Um, first, we know that a significant number of birthing people decided they wanted to avoid the hospital, whether out of fear of COVID infection or to avoid some of these restrictive conditions found in hospitals or both, a combination of both, and instead sought midwifery care for birth at home or in a birth center. Independent midwifery practices reported being overrun with inquiries from pregnant people looking to switch care providers. Um, and they had to turn many people away. So to the extent this experience raises awareness about the midwifery model of care and its commitment to non-intervention, to shared decision-making, um, and to the autonomy of the birthing person, pregnant person, I think that's a good thing. We've seen more visibly than before the shortage of midwives in this country um, and the many places that are effectively midwifery deserts due to overly burdensome regulation of midwives. So if advocates can capitalize on increased awareness of the midwifery shortage during the pandemic and convert that into momentum for reform campaigns, they would expand access to midwifery care and provide birthing people with more choices about where and from whom they receive their care. Second, while some hospitals have eased up on their restrictive visitor policies and enabled doulas to return to the delivery room, other hospitals have continued to restrict access to birth support in various ways. And some hospitals have announced new credentialing requirements for doulas, um, applying an, an application and approval process like those that, um, that, uh, that pertain to hospital vendors and to clinical providers. And this ignores the fact that doulas are not providing medical services, as well as the fact that whether paid or unpaid, the doula enters into an agreement with the birthing person, not with the hospital. It also raises equity issues about who can satisfy the hospital's requirements and the financial burden of fulfilling the credentialing requirement itself. So to the extent that some hospitals are using COVID as an excuse for asserting authority over doulas and trying to limit the impact that they can have, the beneficial impact they can have, this represents an attack on the autonomy of birthing people. And I expect that this is an area where we will see increased advocacy to stop hospitals from interfering with additional support for birthing people. One commentator um, has observed that, that hospitals have used COVID-19 as a pretext to abandon these um, uh, mother-baby friendly practices in ways that have really compromised the health and agency of birthing people. And I think this obser observation cuts right to the heart of the matter here. The last 18 months have been 
yet another chapter in the story of how um, the rights that we understand birthing people to have, rights to autonomy and bodily integrity, the right to informed consent, and the right to refuse medical treatment, rights of self-determination, and even dignity itself, that these rights are unevenly applied and sometimes disappear from the landscape altogether. So to the extent that childbirth experiences under COVID-19 can reinvigorate the conversation about the rights of birthing people, to ensure that those rights are meaningful and enforceable rather than aspirational, that could be one really good thing to come out of this very challenging historical moment that we've all been living through. So I'll stop there and I look forward to, to hearing from my co-panelists and to the discussion later. Thanks so much. Um, thank you, Liz, um, <clears throat> for that interesting set of observations and provocative proposal about how we move forward. Um, we're gonna go on to Marie Carmen Farmer, but we're, sorry. That was your alarm. Before doing so, I wanted to apologize um, for um, using the wrong pronoun for injury with Lucero. Um, you are a they, then I apologize for that. That was a mistake on my part. And I uh, did not do it intentionally. Um, Mari Carmen Farmer, you're up. Okay, great. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm going to share my screen. No, hold on one second. Okay. All right, can you see that on a regular like slide presentation? Yeah, looks Is that good. coming up right? Okay, looks great. Good, yeah. It's hard for me to tell. Okay, so um, thank you for the introduction. My name is Mari Carmen Farmer. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, and I am a midwife at Thomas Jefferson University and I work, um, I do my ambulatory care practice in the city of Philadelphia Health Clinics. Um, and I'm going to just frame a few lessons from um, COVID-19, kind of what some of the stuff that has come out. Liz, you did such a beautiful job of like just handing me a silver platter <laughs> about what midwives do and, you know, the things we care about. So thank you for that. Um, So um, I'm going to start with this quote because I, I really like it. Um, I, in my other life, aside from midwifery, um, we like to say in midwifery that midwifery is activism. And I do a lot of anti-racism and equity training and um, think a lot about structural factors, um, especially around racism. And um, I really like this quote. One, because um, unfortunately it's so old and still applicable. Um, if medicine is to fulfill her great task, then she must enter the political and social life. Um, do we not always find the diseases of the populace traceable to defects in society? And I feel like we wouldn't even be sitting here if this wasn't true. Um, so I thought it was a nice way to start today. So the first lesson um, that I wanted to talk about was um, the idea that we need to continue to center um, a focus on structural racism. Um, and as you see on the slide, that we need to examine the systems we live and work in, dismantle the ones that are causing harm and rebuild them um, with an eye on really looking outside of what we have built so far. You know, I think one of the harms of um, the cis, hetero, white supremacist patriarchy is that um, what we see is what we think is possible or what we think is normal. And we know that there are you know, infinite possibilities for the way to structure a society and to create justice. And, but it's hard to see beyond what our reality is. And one of the great powers of um, oppression is that it, it makes it seem as if this is all there is and we just have to kind of create micro solutions within the system that exists. So um, I, I wanna talk a little bit more about this because this is my favorite thing to talk about really. Um, so, um, most of you will know this, but you know, obviously there are structures that impact um, the set social inequities that we see and the health disparities that we see. And those disparities often run along the lines of race, class, gender, sexuality, and ability. And those structures are, are big things. They're big things related mostly to law and economics. And um, if you look at this next slide, which is a little busy, but I find it to be very um, 
informative in terms of a way to frame. I'm just gonna click through it so you all can see the whole thing. Um, actually, let me go back. I'm trying to make sure I stay in my time, but I'm gonna do it. So if you start here with the social determinants of health, which are um, something that I like to refer to as kind of the things that people see as a, that give them a sense of place. So um, in a lot of the literature and in sort of articles and essays that you'll read, everything becomes a social determinant of health and it, it's not the case. So social determinants of health, you can think of as the local things that are affecting someone's everyday experience. So things like housing, living wage, education, a lot of you know this already, transportation. Um, and those are the things, the everyday things that we see and maybe we're addressing with clients or patients. And when those social determinants of health aren't freely available, when people don't have access to them, um, it leads often to psychosocial stress, chronic stress, and unhealthy behaviors. So a very simple example, if someone doesn't have free access to food, you know, good food, healthy food, fresh food, then they may be, for example, eating um, you know, cheap processed food from the local um, grocery store or convenience store, which may then lead to them having um, a disparity in the distribution of disease, like maybe diabetes or you know, being um, having other types of hypertension, other things that are related to a poor diet. Um, and I just wanna, before I continue, give credit to Dr. Joya Creer Perry, who does a lot of work in birth equity and she's the one who um, gifted me the slide and she adapted it from this, you can see the, the citation here. So if we go then in the opposite direction from social determinants of health, then we see that above them sort of upstream are the structural determinants of health. So things again around the legal and economic system. So big things, things that tend to be much more invisible to the daily person, the person who's not thinking systemically. And if we go upstream from there, then we see um, the root causes of the way that this kind of cascade occurs. And I think it's really important to keep that in mind. Um, I often see racism listed as a social determinant of health and it, it's not, it's a root cause and we should call it that. Um, and, and the other things that are listed above as well. Um, and so I think that um, keeping that view is very important because in COVID-19, we saw that structures really, um, they fell down on the job. You know, they did not, our structures were not designed to care for um, people who were the most vulnerable. And it's important to, to keep um, pointing that out and changing those. Um, okay. So I already went through this, the social determinants of health, they're the things that kind of determine place. And so that's important. This is from healthypeople.gov. Um, and why this matters is because structures create violence. Um, against people, especially people in, at the fringes of society, people who are most vulnerable. And so Paul Farmer, who's a physician who's done lots of global health work and social justice work, primarily in Haiti, but in other places in the world as well. He says that structural violence is one way of describing social arrangements that put individuals and populations in harm's way. And that those arrangements are structural because they are part of the political and economic organization of the world. Um, and they are violent because they cause injury to people. And I think, again, that's super important to remember because um, structural racism and structural violence gets a pass because it's hard to see, because it just is what it is. Um, I love this quote by um, Tore, his, formerly named, his former name is Stokely Carmichael, you might know him better by that name. He says, um, structural racism is less overt and far more subtle, less identifiable in terms of specific individuals committing the acts but is no less destructive of human life. This type of racism originates in the operation of established and respected forces in society, and thus receives far less public condemn condemnation. Um, it leaves individuals and communities destroyed and maimed physically, emotionally, and intellectually because of conditions of poverty and discrimination that are a function of structural racism. And I think Liz, you did a beautiful job of showing some of the ways that that injury happened over the pandemic. Um, okay, so that's the first lesson that I, I'm reflecting on the questions that were asked of us um, that I would say came out of COVID-19 is to really maintain that focus. 
Um, the second one is to keep the people we care for at the center of our decision making. Um, centering voices rooted in lived experience. Sorry, I didn't mean the sign. Um, produce solutions that are more likely to be sustainable, equitable, and trusted by people who will most need access to healthcare and other critical services. Um, and this is a, a really important lesson that we need to learn. And it's starting to happen. I would say in Philly, it's actually um, starting to happen in some very important ways, especially around Black maternal um, mortality. Um, I am fortunate enough to sit on the maternal mortality review team in Philadelphia, and they're making um, Asta Meta and um, the, the Department of Public Health is making some really concerted efforts to put um, people with lived experience at the center of, of power, the people who make some decisions around what recommendations get enacted, where funding goes to create solutions to the Black maternal mor morbidity crisis. Um, but it's a lesson that, that we have a, a long way to go. Um, we, we know that the voices of the most affected are often not considered or disregarded, especially in favor of voices that, that favor the status quo, that carry institutional power, and that advocate solutions that profit or otherwise benefit the institutions that already exist, the ones that have money and that have power. Um, we know that um, this has been really evident in reproductive health care, where, again, back to Liz's talk, um, you know, things that families really want, like alternative birth settings in the community, have been disregarded because, you know, the, the medical industrial complex, you know, owns the power share. They, they really kind of run the system. It's very difficult. I, I've been um, a birth activist in the city since the late 90s, and we still don't have a birth center in the city. We've been trying this entire time. And um, we have a FQHC who is pretty well established in the city, who's been working on it for the last seven years. It's still not open. I mean, hopefully it will be open, you know, hope springs eternal and they're working really hard, but the legal and economic barriers to start a birth center for people who, you know, don't have insurance or have people who have Medicaid, it's, extremely difficult um, and that's very frustrating. And then when there's a medical emergency like there is right now, then we don't have those systems. We're not investing in, for example, underfunded public health departments. And now those departments are scrambling to meet the need that exists. So um, I think providing solutions in response to what the people who are most affected want is another really important, seems super obvious, but we certainly don't do it enough. So um, I raised my hand, I hate to interrupt, but I wanted to make sure you're down to about two and a half minutes. Two minutes. And you're lesson two, so please. Thanks, proceed. I'm just moving to lesson two, actually. Thank you. Um, so lesson three is uh, around regulation and policy and collaboration and um, cross-pollination. So that we should really be supporting regulation and policy that allows for institutions to work together, to really um, create solutions that where there's overlap between the different institutions and organizations, they are definitely not find common ground. Um, I don't think that's an impossible thing. Um, and I think we can find solutions that both reflect and retract structural and systemic barriers and challenges. Um, I think cross-pollinated strategies, like it says here, are the ones that give people honestly, usually the most access and the most voice. So really collaboration and cross-pollination is I think the third lesson. And we were forced to do that in great part in ways that maybe were not so pleasant during COVID-19 and kind of difficult because we don't generally do it on a day-to-day -day basis, but it's happening more and more in Philly, which is really great. Um, and just my last slide is just um, a point about radical imagination. Again, back to kind of my original point, I think, one of the things that COVID-19 has forced us to do because it is a something we could have never imagined and also because it's forced us to reach for solutions we could have never imagined is an opportunity for radical imagination. I'm sure many of you know who Adrienne Marie Brown is. Um, and she says, they say, I believe that all organizing is science fiction, that we are shaping the future we long for and have not yet experienced. This is how we practice the future together. I suspect this is what many of us are up to, practicing futures together and living into new stories. It is our right and responsibility to create a new world. Um, and I, I really great, I'm really grateful for this conversation 
to do that. So thank you so much. Thank you. Perfect timing. Um, next up, we have Emmeline Reyes of PhD Candidate at Temple. Hi. All right. So I'm just going to share my screen real quick as well. Um, oh, sorry. You're still sharing. I can't share yet. Let me, see. Let me try again. There we go. Thank you. All right. So let me put this in. You. All right. So, can you guys see these slides? There yes. Go. Awesome. Thank you. Um, hi, I'm Emmeline Reyes. I use she, her, hers pronouns. I'm a graduate student at Temple University studying medical anthropology and reproductive health. Um, I want to thank you for attending this presentation. I'm looking forward to discussing my research on how the COVID-19 crisis has impacted the pregnancy and childbirth experiences of Puerto Rican women um, and the midwives who assist them. So let's get started. In times of catastrophe, the most vulnerable populations, including pregnant people, are acutely and disproportionately impacted. During the COVID-19 crisis, we have seen headlines across the nation reporting on pregnant people who have decided to labor in their homes or doulas who were barred from entering hospitals, in addition to the more biologically focused concerns of how COVID impacts the pregnant body and infant development. Puerto Rico, which is a US territory with a legacy of colonial control and exploitation is in a particularly precarious position when it comes to COVID and maternal well-being, as its citizens have historically struggled with reproductive justice and access to adequate health care, issues that I will later discuss. In recent years, Puerto Rico has been in the process of recovering from the September um, 2017 hurricanes Irma and Maria and the January 2020 earthquakes. These adverse events took a toll on the economy and infrastructure of the island and have continued to complicate the COVID responses from what I have observed. In this presentation, I will discuss how disaster and in particular COVID has impacted pregnancy and childbirth experiences in Puerto Rico, as well as maternal care systems and the labors of local birth workers who are often on the front lines of disaster care. To provide some background on reproductive services on the island, there are only about two dozen practicing independent midwives in Puerto Rico, all of whom are certified professional midwives or CPMs uh, who are not allowed to practice in hospitals. Their work is uh, within the home in this way. The official home birth rate in Puerto Rico is is less than 1%, though the rate may be growing as during COVID we have observed an increased reliance on midwives and a shift of births from the hospital to the home as we have in previous disasters uh, starting in 2017. This is due in large part to the fears of infection similar to the fear of leaving uh, the home witnessed at the height of the Zika, Zika epidemic uh, on the island, which was worsened by the hurric hurricanes and the earthquakes. While home births are wonderful, we also must acknowledge that the, um, there are complications in this shift from the home to the hospital for both birth workers uh, and pregnant people, which I will also later discuss. Uh, so in order to understand how COVID impacted pregnancy and birth in Puerto Rico, I conducted 11 virtual interviews with Puerto Rican women working in the field of reproductive health and justice, including five midwives, a doula, a clinical psychologist in a NICU, a social worker focused on combating gender violence, a childbirth photojournalist, a midwifery student, and a fellow researcher. I conducted these interviews via Zoom and on the phone, primarily in English, a uh, second language for the birth workers of the island, with some Spanish spoken intermittently. Each participant was interviewed multiple times to track how the pandemic and responses to it changed over the time span of April to August 2020. Interviews were semi-structured and interlocutors were encouraged to speak freely and redirect the conversation as they saw fit. The results of these interviews were mixed with interlocutors relaying some stories of difficulty and despair and some messages of hope and resilience. I will, uh, <laughs> I can't say the word present. I will present these findings in the slides ahead in terms of three emergent themes, birth locations, social implications and technological <laughs> innovations doing wonderfully today. Thank you. Um, so first, birth locations, of course. As I, shift, uh, as I previously discussed in terms of birth locations, uh, COVID shifted birth from the hospital to the home. It is important to note that home births are not accessible to all who would prefer them. 
Lack of insurance coverage creates inaccessibility, but so does housing insecurity and lack of essential supplies caused by previous disasters, right? Like the hurricanes, um, which caused a lot of destruction for everybody. Even with these limitations, um, home births and midwife attendant births have significantly increased recently. So restrictions surrounding duels and other support persons certainly contributed to this, um, as was noted earlier, but also many pregnant people were anxious about the state of the hospitals as they knew that sick patients um, could potentially transmit the virus to them, their babies and their families. In addition to the fact that many hospital personnel would be overwhelmed by surges in patients from the virus. Here on the right-hand side of the slide, I've provided an excerpt from a quote provided by a midwife who unfortunately witnessed a client lose her baby um, after transferring her to a hospital. I will now read you the full quote. One of my clients called me in May and said she hadn't felt the baby move. I went to check up on her and could hear movement, but could also tell that something was wrong. So I took my client to the hospital and called and told them what was going on and how this woman needed a nurse to check her vitals and physically examine her. The thing is they, the hospitals, aren't hiring nurses and other personnel like they should be. So I spoke with a nurse and said, I'm sending my client and you need to do these things. And she, my client, showed up at the hospital and they didn't do anything. Guess what? There was one nurse on that floor. In the end, the baby died in the hospital. She had a stillbirth. They, the hospitals, need more people. Things would have been different if there was a nurse who could have attended to my client. It probably would have been a C-section, but that baby would be alive today. There are less and less people in the hospitals. This has been such an issue and continues to be one. And people who are, and the people who are there are giving worse care too. They are overextended because so many left the mass exodus after Maria. You can feel that. As my interlocutor explains, this lack of support and delivery can be detrimental. The restrictions placed on family members and trained duels and midwives entering the hospital only served to instill more fear in delivering women and created more reluctance to give birth in hospitals. Because of this transition from uh, home to the hospital, the COVID-19 crisis has created more conflict between medical community, um, between the medical community and independent midwives, as you can see from the previous quote. Many medical professionals feel that their domain is being threatened by the embrace of alternative approaches to birth, such as doulas, midwives, and home births. To combat this, doctors in Puerto Rico have tried to promote the message that the hospital is the safest place to give birth, Home births are dangerous and midwives are not competent or well-trained. These conceptions are based on harmful stereotypes about midwives who on the island are primarily women of color and whose approaches to healing are grounded in indigenous and African traditions. Midwives have been historically devalued and they continue to be denied respect and recognition even today as they save lives on the front lines of disasters. This lack of institutional support puts midwives' lives in danger as they are not afforded the same protections and recognize, um, as recognized healthcare workers. Birth during disaster has been stressful for both the birth workers assisting in deliveries and the people giving birth themselves. The isolation of quarantine has been incredibly difficult for parents, children, and families. The following quote of which I provided an excerpt of on the right-hand side of the slide illustrates the toll that COVID um, has taken on maternal mental health. The full quote is as follows. Pregnant families are taking care of themselves the most. They are the ones quarantining in the house. I had a client who canceled her appointment with me six weeks away because she was worried about COVID. I had worked with her leading up to her birth, which ended up being a C-section, but even a C-section, I do the postpartum care. She declined these last visits because she wanted to protect the baby. She wasn't letting anyone visit, even me as a midwife, but I respected her wishes and said, okay, I hope you are both safe and healthy. As we can see here, disease anxiety has led to heightened isolation and health behaviors that could be detrimental or even risky, including declining postnatal care and support. With the social distancing practices put in place as a result of the pandemic, telehealth or telemedicine was used for prenatal and postnatal appointments for both midwives and obstetricians. Hospital protocols became more strict, such as limit, uh, limited support persons, COVID screenings um, and separations post-delivery, and even home births became more clinical in the form of protective gear worn, distance kept from patients and less company allowed than usual. In home births, at least, these restrictions began to ease over time. Many midwives were the first to turn away from telehealth as restrictions began to lighten, social distancing in prenatal and postnatal in-person visits and only using telehealth when absolutely necessary, such as initial meetings. When necessary, telehealth could be considered constructive because it ensures safety, engages patients, and can be considered quick and convenient. 
However, telehealth could be considered detrimental because it removes the contact um, and connection of care. It could lead to incompetent care and puts all responsibility on the patients and re removes much of it from the practitioner. Some midwives are concerned that telehealth can be dangerous and that doctors may continue to use it even post pandemic. The following quote, which is a part, um, which part of is provided on the right hand side of the slide is from a midwife who explains why she is concerned about telehealth in the clinical community. I don't like to use telehealth. I think it's pretty dangerous actually. I worry that it's being abused by a lot of doctors who are using it because they think, oh, I don't even have to touch someone and I can still make money for my home. It's negligent really. I will do my initial interview through telehealth, but I will not recruit clients online. And then after that, I will go in person and wear a mask and screen the clients and discuss ethics and protocols. But these doctors, they were doing five minute appointments anyway, even before COVID. Now it's like nothing. I mean, I know some midwives are doing it, especially birth centers, and it's a choice, but I'm just not comfortable with that. I'm following protocols in person and anything I can do additionally online, I will. I just worry that, um, that now that telehealth is an option, it is just going to continue to be abused. This concern expressed by my interlocutor may be something that we need to consider and keep an eye out for in the future, even following the pandemic. Overall, the birth workers I spoke with agreed that more than anything, COVID has been making matters of reproductive health and justice more polarized. The divide between Western medicine and traditional midwifery uh, existed pre-COVID, but it is more exaggerated now and characterized by vitriol and intolerance. Midwives refer to their increased persecution by the Puerto Rican obstetric community as a witch hunt, a fear campaign, and a crusade against midwives. The virus is also making more evident the extreme structural inequalities between the wealthy and the poor that existed already, um, but are more visible now and more severe due to the fragile state of the economy during the pandemic. As this is a legal symposium, I wanted to highlight some of the legal implications both discussed in my article um, that was shared with you all and discovered through my continued research. So in, re in reviewing the literature on the history of reproductive justice in Puerto Rico and speaking with Puerto Rican birth workers, I have learned that while Puerto Rican midwifery is not illegal, it is also not legal either. The midwives lack legal protection, but also institutional control in this way, giving them a freedom to practice and no one managing them. While fighting for institutional midwifery support and policy changes that facilitate home birth could be beneficial, there could also be disadvantages um, because being regulated by the government could hinder care that midwives administer and could get in the way of their grassroots and community-based practices. As I mentioned in my article, doulas were previously protected on the island and were granted access to hospitals, preventing discrimination and ensuring support to all those who wanted and needed it. Um, but when COVID happened, there was a temporary hospital ban. Doulas and families fought for their right to return back to the hospital and are now allowed back in all delivery rooms on the island with one exception, um, one public facility with very high infection rates. Prior to COVID, but following the hurricanes, midwives were working with policymakers and the local government to create a uh, proclama or a proclamation that would support and protect midwives. This was actually initiated on behalf of the government um, after they saw how midwives handled Maria. Unfortunately, I'm unsure of how this initiative has progressed in COVID. Um, so just finishing up some more legal implications. I know I've got about a minute left, so I'll try to go quick. In her book, Pushing in Silence, anthropologist Isabel Cordova describes how formal midwifery came to be on the island um, by the way of white European colonizers, though indigenous birth workers existed on the island before. Um, so I'm just gonna summarize this actually, since I'm running out of time. Uh, so essentially what happened was uh, the only midwives who were working in hospitals uh, at the time of um, you know, colonization and um, basically like occupation uh, were white European midwives. And this largely left out uh, midwives uh, with a slave ancestry and midwives of an indigenous ancestry. But because these women of color were not able to practice in the hospitals, they were largely the ones attending uh, home births, right? Which is a pattern we kind of see play out today. Other issues um, that have historically been a problem and continue to be right, of course, are um, sterilization, eugenics, uh, oral contraceptive testing, regulations surrounding abortions, and we still see this today with LARCs and um, unequal access to abortions. So I know I'm at time, so I'll just wrap up there. Um, but thank you, and if you have any 
questions, uh, please feel free to let me know. Uh, thank you for your presentation and spotlighting the uh, experience in Puerto Rico. It's really interesting work, and I'm sure that there are parallels in certain pockets of um, the mainland United States as well. So thank you for doing that. Um, and hopefully we'll get to some questions for you later. Um, <clears throat> next up, I understand that Professor Davis Floyd, you are here, is that correct? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Uh, you have 14 minutes. Um, um, can you see my PowerPoint? We cannot. We cannot see you or your PowerPoint. Um, okay, what do I do? I don't remember what to do. Um, so you want to do a start video to show yourself, and then you want to do share screen, the green button in the middle of your, um, your panel at the bottom to share your screen. I, ha I had to leave for a second to try to um, do something and it, it didn't work. I don't know. Um, Professor Davis Floyd, I have your slides and I'm happy to share them on my screen and you can just let me know when you would like me to switch to the next one if that works for okay. you. Yeah, let's let's do that. Thank you, Emily. Okay, Professor Davis Floyd, it's it's all you. I think you are still muted, Professor Davis Floyd. It says, can you hear me now? Yes. It says you cannot start screen share while the other participant is sharing. So, and so uh, you don't need to screen share because um, Emily has shared her your slides already. So you can just um, proceed. Do you can see, you them see mine? If she takes hers down, can you see mine? I believe so, but I think they're one and the same, but whatever you prefer. Yeah, let me try to use mine. Okay. Never mind. I can't figure out how to make it work. Just go ahead and use Emily's. Okay, your slides are up now, Professor Davis Floyd. Just let me know whenever you would like me to switch to the next. Okay, next. So the state of midwifery care in the U.S., there are around 3,000 CPM certified professional midwives attending around 2% of births all in homes and birth centers. These are collectively called community births. CPMs who have been shown to have excellent outcomes are legal licensed and regulated in only 36 states with legislation long pending in the other 14. Um, there are around 13,000 certified nurse midwives, CNMs, attending 10% of US births. Of these, only around 200 attend community births. Next. As soon as the pandemic hit the U.S., requests for community midwife services skyrocketed, just like in Puerto Rico, due to fears of hospital contagion and other factors. Many CPMs turned down requests for community births that were due to fear of hospital contagion. Those who accepted them found that their transfer rates increased because successful home births usually require an ideological commitment and a belief in the well-proven safety of home births and births in freestanding birth centers. Community midwives are doing their best to meet the on ongoing demand, which rose again when the Delta variant hit. Usually, community midwives attend two to four births per month to avoid exhaustion and burnout. Now, many are attending up to four to eight births a month, leading to exhaustion and burnout, especially when births cluster. Next. Logical conclusion, the U.S. needs many more community midwives. Next. There are only 10 nationally accredited schools for CPM. 
They cannot practice legally in 14 states, and only in some states are they insurance reimbursed, making their care unaffordable to many. Next. Advantages to increasing community care. If only 10% more U.S. births took place in homes and freestanding birth centers, $11 billion would be saved per year. To 321 million for each percentage point rate. <clears throat> Due to increasingly rapid climate change, billions of people will be displaced along with many animal species and plants, making future pandemics inevitable. When hospitals are overwhelmed or destroyed, the power is out. Where will birthing women, where will the birthing women go who will attend them? Next. Imagine a country filled with freestanding birth centers in every community staff with skilled community midwives who can also attend home births. Imagine that instead of 35,000 obstetricians, we had 50,000 midwives attending the vast majority of births with obstetricians reserved for truly high-risk cases. Imagine that instead of centralizing birth in tertiary-level hospitals, maternity care is decentralized with a community of midwife or several easily available and insurance reimbursed and transport systems and protocols in place. Recall that pre-medicalized birth in the U.S., historical records show that 90, 95% of births attended by communities midwives happen safely. Imagine that when pandemics, earthquakes, hurricanes, and tsunamis hit, there are plenty of community midwives to respond. Let's look at some real world examples. Next. <clears throat> so I'm gonna talk about disaster care provided by two community midwives, Vicki Penwell and Robin Lim. Next, they're both CPNs. Next. <clears throat> so the, on the left is Robin, with, uh, hugging a woman whose birth she attended in, in uh, Bali, in, uh, in, in, in in Indonesia, and Vicky is on the right. Next. So Vicky Penwell runs Mercy in Action, an NGO that creates birth centers in the Philippines. Next. These are some of the, this is one of the birth centers they created. The model is that they create the birth center. They, they take a year or two to train Filipino midwives, for professional midwives how to do birth under the midwifery model of care, because they have to be re-socialized from their hospital training. And then they turn the birth center over to those community midwives and move on and create another one somewhere else. Next. Mercy Midwives Birthing Home in Olongo Civic Bay is their present site, begun by Vicki Fenwell, her husband Scott, their son Ian, his wife Rose, Vicki, Ian, and Rose are all CPMs and licensed midwives. And, you, and it, I just want to point out that Ian and Rose are probably the only two married CPMs in the world. This center is now run by Philippine licensed midwives. That's the model. Train the locals, then move on. Next. Vicki says, our mothers come from the tribes in the surrounding mountains and the garbage dump in our community. These are two of the poorest communities with high rates of malnutrition and disease. Do a lot of education on childbirth and child survival and teach natural family planning. We also do primary medical care. Next. There's Vicki on the left, Rose is here, and Ian on the right. They're, again, they're the only two married CPMs. Next. <clears throat> We get mercy in action statistics on more than 12,000 births show that we run a maternal mortality rate that is eight times lower and a neonatal mortality rate that is four times lower than the country we're in. Next. So when Hurricane Haiyan Yolanda, Haiyan Yolanda hit in the Philippines, Leyte was the, the city of Leyte was the hardest hit. If you look on the left, you can see how it was before, and you look on the right, and you see those exact same sites later afterwards. Next. As soon as Hurricane Haiyan Wanda in 2013 had passed, we split everything we had down the middle and headed to Leyte, the epicenter, in two vans. Our disaster response was informed by the teachings they had already been offering about disaster care. Next but nothing could prepare us for what we would see. Next. 
the total devastation, the massive loss of life. Next. The scenes of destruction everywhere. Next. These are the remains of a once beautiful birth center. Next. The grief of the survivors, the magnitude of what they lost. Next. And yet the strength of character and resiliency of the Philippine people, as I imagine it was for the Puerto Rican people. Next. Setting up tents to begin caring for patients. Next. Later, we were given a conference room in a broken school. At least there were walls. Next. And we set up our medical and maternity tents inside. Next. Identifying and training local midwives. Again, that's the model. Next. <clears throat> Next. We brought a birth stool, rope pole, and strong headboard for women to pull on to give birth on all fours. Our birth tent was small, but private and well stocked. Next. Here's some of the babies that pulled the gay birth in that birth center. Next. Every baby was given delayed cord cleaning, sterile cord cutting, and new recommendations recommended fluorohexidine on the cord to prevent the risk of neonatal tetanus. Next. No unnecessary or harmful practices were allowed and careful records were kept. Next. Next. I guess so. It is important to remember that we provided our care in tents with no electricity or running water. Everything was kept as clean as possible. High-tech interventions are rarely needed in birth, but community wise are. Next. All babies have the option to receive a vitamin K shot, have B vaccination, and I next. We gave every woman tetanus immunizations in pregnancy. Next. We brought food door to door to pregnant and lactating women. Next. We held healing trauma seminars for the community. Next. Brought our ambulance for transports or home visits for sick babies. Next. The non-inflatable anti-shot garment, NASG, is the one on the WHO recommended list for hemorrhage treatment. We had the only NSA, NASGs in the disaster zone. Next. We ordered more from China and donated and trained other midwives in their use. Next. We doted, donated one to Doctors Without Borders and trained all of them. Next. We cooperated with the UN Disaster Response Coordinators. Next. Cargan with Solar Suitcase and Laurel Satchel, whose husband invented it, came to visit. A solar suitcase, for those who don't know, can power an entire floor of a hospital. Next. We partnered with governments, NGOs, schools, and churches. Next. A C-130 military cargo plane took Vicky for a supply run to restock. Next. We attended NGO meetings and procured food for our patients. Next. And we helped bury the dead. Next. Next. We achieved the WHO UNICEF Baby Friendly Hospital Initiative with the 10 steps to successful breastfeeding. Next. 100% of our patients breastfed. Next. Even this cleft palate baby nursed. Next. UNICEF gave us a tent to be used for breastfeeding support. Next. Mercy in Action's disaster response. Total documented medical encounters. 3,616 patients in 65 days. <clears throat> total deliveries 100. Go back. Total deliveries 116. Total wound care 1,532. 
Total breastfeeding women's bed ongoing, 648. Total pregnant women fed and on, given ongoing pregnant care. I can't see that on my screen. Healing trauma seminars, 196 children and adults, and adults, no deaths or perinatal mortgage. Next. We rebuilt a destroyed birth center of a local midwife and trained others to work with her. Next. On January 30, 31, 2014, we turned the disaster tent over to Robin Lim. Next. Robin went on to buy, um, to build, to, to run the, to pay, Bumi Seha ended up establishing a facility there in the Philippines. The Bumi Seha Foundation in Bali, founded by CPM Robin Lim, who later won the CNN Hero, Hero of the Year Award. Next. Robin Lim, Bumi Seha, and the aftermath of the Aceh tsunami. Next. This is the tsunami you seen through the eyes of a six-year-old child. Next. Um, Professor Davis Floyd, you're up against time. Um, can okay, you wrap give up me one more minute. One more minute. Bumi Seha at first provided care from their truck and immediately started a lot forging alliance with local midwives. Next. Hmm. Burning the cord, next. Hmm. Next. They created alliances with local midwives, providing them with mobile phones and teaching them how to use them. This was crucial for communication. Next. Next. And then they built a beautiful um, birth center, which has become a community center as well in Aceh. Next, care provision in the birth center. Next, later, Bumi Sehat Bali took in and cared for hundreds of families fleeing the volcanic eruptions in Bali. Their disaster relief is ongoing with consistent belly better outcomes than for the country as a whole. Next, thank you. <laughs> uh, thank that you, Professor. Close Virginia. enough to time. <laughs> uh, thank you for um, reining it in at the end. Um, last but not least, the, the, we bottom have... line, the bottom line message is that birth, birth care should be decentralized. Understood. Thank you. Um, last but not least, we have Indra Wood Lucero, um, a practitioner from Colorado. Hello all, glad to be here today, glad to follow my distinguished colleagues. I look forward to building on what everyone has talked about and maybe, maybe tying things together a bit. Um, I start with this image of a portal um, to evoke your imagination about portals and maybe invite you to reconnect with those you know, early experiences of the pandemic as a portal in the way that portals are, you know, places that transport us to somewhere new, opportunities to kind of, you know, jump through the barriers of time and space in order to have a new perception or a new experience. This is kind of, kind of building on and, and, related to what Mari Carmen was talking about in terms of the possibilities and what is perceptible. So a rupture like the pandemic actually provides us an opportunity to change our sight, to, to have more perception. Um, this is something that some people have for other reasons, often, often the result of being marginalized in society. I know my experience of, a Lat uh, 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 of being a Latinx person from the Northern New Mexico, Southern Colorado area where the borders have crossed us many times and being a queer and gender queer person have given me portal opportunities where I can see um, you know, like the structures of society in particular ways because of the rupture that my interface with those structures provide. 
So first of all, I invite you all to, to take a little different stance to the pandemic, not just as a crisis, but also an opportunity. I think within that opportunity, for me, there have been at least four, four key takeaways. So I'm gonna take you through those four key takeaways. Again, inviting you to reflect on the, the pandemic as an opportunity to see anew or see differently. The first is this idea that human rights are actually a health outcome, that we need to be thinking about human rights at the same time that we're thinking about health. This is one of those things that the, the pandemic provided to us. Especially, I think, pregnant people, people who were considering planning to give birth in hospitals. S suddenly, the hospital as a site of infection, a potential site of infection or virus transmission became more pronounced. It's a thing that was already always true but became more pronounced. Which then of course begs the question, is that a place for an otherwise healthy laboring person to be? The question then in terms of human rights is, how do we simultaneously prevent disease transmission while also protecting human rights? I use this image of bar barbed wire um, because one of the biggest human rights violations that I learned about during the, you know, these past several months has to do with barriers between people and barriers to motion, it, both in terms of the birthing process and in terms of virus transmission or avoiding virus transmission. One of the things that my organization, Elephant Circle, did early in the pandemic was essentially open a, a Google form to people for people to report violations, human rights violations they were experiencing in the perinatal period during the pandemic. And the, the majority of the reports re we received had to do with people not being allowed to be with people, including sadly newborns being separated from their families. A quote from one of the people who complained of that experience is, I get a 10 minute virtual visit a day. This is absolutely heartbreaking. I can't hold my son. I can't see my son. My son can't see or feel me. And this is a newly postpartum person talking about their infant newborn, a, a 10 minute virtual visit a day. So while there may have been reasons for that separation to prevent disease transmission, although um, that's questionable too, if we allow that there may be some um, you know, medical reason for such a separation, we have to balance that, that reason with the human rights, the human rights of both that infant and that newly postpartum person, both of whom benefit physically, but also in a, in a substantive sort of autonomy and dignity way from being connected. Of course, there's the example that um, Liz mentioned at the beginning, when these kinds of separations also compound existing race-based um, harms, structural, structural determinants of health, as Mari Carmen talked about, the significance of these human rights violations are, you know, compounded. So in New Mexico, when it was particularly indigenous people who were targeted for this separation. And if you think about the history of the separation of children from indigenous families, that the compounding of this, you know, COVID response has, you know, significant long-term consequences. 
This, this leads to the other big observation, which is this portal illustrates to us where to look for connection and disconnection. These points of connection and points of disconnection illustrate the structures, um, the structures that exist and the structures that can be changed. I use this image because I think it, it shows how powerful and important, important connection is and how you know, many lengths people will go to to find connection you know, through many barriers. I mean, just the barrier of the personal protective equipment that the people pictured are, are wearing. And the power, the power of connection to transcend those barriers. I think this, this illustrates what a profound, important, um, you know, human right connection essentially is. This also relates to Mari Carmen's lesson number two, um, when, when she talked about looking to community-based solutions, um, because often community-based solutions are grounded in connection. They're about drawing short lines between people, immediate accessible lines between people. And there's something so powerful to those community-based solutions because they're grounded in connection. Another key observation is that the least expensive things are some of the best things. And I wanna be clear that this doesn't mean that these things shouldn't be valued or possibly even worth more. But what the, what the pandemic illustrated, especially with regard to perinatal care, is that the things that aren't being valued the things that don't have industry investing in them are available to us as powerful solutions um, and powerful places where we can reorganize how the perinatal care system is set up. We could reorganize our system to better value, to better leverage those things that are less costly. Of course, this includes midwives as other speakers have mentioned, but it also illustrates, I think, the nature of birth. As, you know, the physiology of birth doesn't, as, as Robbie mentioned, doesn't require a lot of cost, a lot of technology. <clears throat> the fact that people do give birth even in disasters, the fact that people do give birth even during pandemics, isn't, isn't just a story of the resilience of the human spirit, but it's also a story of the nature of the thing. And once we know the nature of the thing, we can better organize ourselves around that. Hopefully, I think part of what this portal of the pandemic has illustrated is that we're poorly organized around the reality of this thing of birth, which is a thing that doesn't demand a lot of technology, but does demand a lot of connection. And that's not how the system is currently organized. The final, I think, and one of the most important things that the pandemic has illustrated is that risk isn't the same for everyone. This, this is true with regard in particular to those structural determinants that Mari Carmen talked about. So if the system is oriented towards assessing what your virus transmission risk is, it will miss calculations about how systems disadvantage certain people over other people, which is also a risk. Again, going back to that example from New Mexico, where Indigenous people were targeted for a separation that has, you know, ancestral trauma built into it. That risk of such profound trauma wasn't part of the hospital's risk analysis that they were applying to those 
to those families. But clearly for those families, it would have been a risk calculation had they been given the opportunity to articulate what their risk calculation was. And that's one of the things I think this portal gives us an opportunity to see too, are the places where singular risk analysis doesn't, doesn't serve and certainly doesn't serve everyone equally. In fact, we can guarantee that the result of a singular risk analysis will be in equity. The other thing about risk that I think um, <clears throat> Mari Carmen talked a little bit about, Emmeline talked a little bit about, is the risk of corruptibility. What, what the pandemic has also illustrated is that there are places in our system with regard to perinatal care that are corruptible. <clears throat> Even this intervention of telehealth has been corrupted in some places. So it's been used not as a tool to increase access to healthcare providers or to improve quality of care, but another way to <clears throat> cut costs or provide less care or less access. So one of the risks that I would hope that our, our system could better calculate for are those risks of corruption. Where, where is the system at risk of being corrupted? <clears throat> another, another risk point that I think has been underappreciated in this area is <clears throat> the risk that incarcerated people face, particularly incarcerated parents, newly postpartum people, or pregnant or laboring people. The additional <clears throat> risk, not only to their human rights, but also how their confinement put them in the position of greater risk of virus transmission, which is kind of on the flip side of people being sort of confined from each other, being forced to be in a high risk situation. And the other population is folks experiencing. And you're okay in time, so please try to wrap it up. Thank you. Great, perfect. Um, folks experiencing a substance use disorder, um, similar to some of the drugs that would allow people to have um, abortions at home. There are medications for substance use disorder that are overly regulated because of their perceived risk. Um, this risk calculus, calculus uh, of course, advantages some, those providers who go through the extra training um, essentially can have sort of a monopoly on providing this kind of care, which of course doesn't serve, you know, pregnant people who need access to medication during the course of their pregnancy and into postpartum. So with that, I'll conclude, and I look forward to discussing the opportunities this portal provides. A uh, fantastic presentation. I really like the, the portal metaphor and I really appreciate how you incorporated the earlier talks. Thank you for, um, I guess, I thank Emily for making you last. You did a really good job of wrapping things up. Um, we have only 10 minutes for conversation and I wanted to, Put something out there first and then allow the audience to raise your hands. I, I realize that there are Q&A things there and some of them answer, some of them not. So if you have a question, just raise your hand and I'll call on you. But for me, I want to make um, get a better sense of what seems to be a conflicting set of narratives here. On the one hand, in your paper, Liz, you talk about how there are lots of births in hospitals and there's an exclusion of the sort of um, um, the doula or the midwife from that process. And that's a problem. On the other hand, I'm hearing that for many families, they decided to not go to hospitals because of this fear of, of infection. Overall, is it a net positive or negative as far as doula or midwife usage through the pandemic? Because I think those two narratives are seemingly conflicting, but I don't know that they are. What are your thoughts on that, Liz? And maybe um, uh, Emmeline and maybe Robbie could chime in as well. Does that make sense, Liz? In terms um, of the... I, 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 so, so I think I, one of your point, one of your points was that there's, sorry, there's a lot of um, hospital births that excluded the 
doula or midwife or other support person, right? On the other hand, I'm hearing that there are many more home births now due to the fact that people are scared of, were scared of going to hospitals, right? So overall, is that a net positive or negative for the doula midwifery industry? And not to put it in crude terms, but that's what I was getting at. Got it. So well, in, in terms, of, Robbie, you want to go ahead? No, you go. In terms of the, um, you know, sort of um, decision to, to try to avoid a hospital birth and seek out community birth with a midwife, I mean, I think some people were successful at that and a lot of people weren't um, because um, either they're, they're just, there wasn't enough supply of midwives, there was nobody who could take them on as a client, or they weren't an appropriate candidate for an out-of-hospital birth, right? You know, midwives who are practicing in birth centers and at home um, have, you know, a risk evaluation process that they go through. Not everybody is an appropriate candidate um, uh, for, for um, home birth. And so people evaluate those risks differently, um, uh, you know, but those are important considerations. So I think it's, you know, to the extent that um, that this experience is a portal for um, for pregnant people, for people who are intending to, to to be pregnant and give birth in the future, to to realize that there are options that don't consist of um, uh, you know there's one hospital that I can go to, there's one sort of provider team that I can right that that there are I can ask questions and sort of see about where I feel safest giving birth, um, whether it's during COVID or in non-pandemic times. I think that that's a good thing, right? I think that that, that sort of um, the, the out of, born out of crisis, right? To look around desperately and say, is there a way that I can avoid going to the hospital and potentially exposing me and my baby um, uh, to COVID? Um, that 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 kind of um, that kind of you know awareness, increased awareness, and sort of consciousness raising about the the various models for giving birth, the kinds of locations, and the and the um, the fact that that midwives are are and can be available, right? They're not available in every community. Um, you know, it's we're still talking about a very small proportion of, um, certainly in terms of thinking about births taking place outside of the hospital, a very small proportion of um, of the overall births every year, and that might be sort of not totally clear given how how much all of us, right, have have um, talked about the importance of midwives and how we see that midwives um, and the midwifery model um, presents. Um, a, a, a vision and a path forward and maybe a set of solutions to some of the things that we don't think are working particularly well in, um, in the sort of mainstream um, uh, medical approach to childbirth currently. And I was going to add, can you hear me? Yes. Um, I would just add to that, that doulas, um, um, that it has been a positive for doulas in the way that because they were kicked out of most hospitals in the US and other places during COVID um, <clears throat> and women were so distressed over that and often chose home birth because they could not have their partner or their, especially, or their doula with them or had to choose between them. I think it brought more awareness to the importance of doulas. Yeah, that was my suspicion. and. Um... It's interesting to hear uh, both sides of it, and I get it now and how the two are reconcilable. Um, did you want to chime in? Uh, Emmeline, are you still there? No. Um, so, Liz, I see you have a question as well for one of your co panelists. Would you mind sharing with us? Sure. Mari Carmen, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the sort of idea of cross pollinization, right? And thinking about um, collaboration, right? Maybe collaborations that and you sort of alluded to this, that maybe were, were forced upon us during COVID um, uh, in ways that were kind of born out of uh, necessity and crisis, um, but also thinking about um, opportunities, right? And if we're thinking about the portal, right? What, um, what would you like to see in terms of, of cross-pollinization, in terms of um, collaborations in sort of a vision for, for what this looks like in the future? Thanks. Um, so some of the examples that come to mind right away is um, more of a focus on um, transfer between home birth and hospital birth um, and really making those transfers safe and collaborative and um, you know, respectful um, of both the clients and the midwives. And I think, um, I think in Philly, actually, we do a really good job of um, collaboration between 
uh, hospital-based midwives and community midwives, but I don't think that the hospital system outside of the midwives, like the physicians and other folks who work there, um, were taking such an interest in that. But suddenly it was kind of like all hands on deck and okay, if you're gonna do this, let's do it as safely as possible. And it really provided an opportunity for hospital-based midwives to educate our peers around home birth and to let them know how much we respect them and how much we do collaborate outside of the hospital walls, outside of their gaze, let's say. Um, and so I, I think that's definitely um, a good example. I think also um, not, not, you know, sort of along the lines of what Robbie was just saying about doulas and how they, their visibility increased. I think um, the attention paid to black maternal mortality um, really went up and therefore the funding went up and the opportunities to do things went up, you know, and this is really where Philly kind of took, you know, they got money from um, Mark for Mothers and Safer Childbirth um, Cities and really have been able to um, increase the reach of the public health department around uh, reproductive health care in ways that are creating models for other cities and other places in the United States. So it's something I'm really proud of. Unfortunately, it took kind of COVID to make that happen, but but it did happen. Um, I had another example and I can't, I can't quite think of it, but I think especially kind of creating, um, as people say, unlikely bedfellows, you know, like hospital-based institutions and out of hospital base. And also um, like in this situation, like um, different professions, interdisciplinary, like the legal world and the medical world. And uh, one of the things we're talking about on the um, Philadelphia maternal mortality team is how can we do things like equip providers in triages and ERs to um, be kind of more effective first responders for people facing intimate partner violence. And I imagine that, you know, the legal world could be a huge help in that case um, where we could create partnerships in that provide real time help to people because we, we see that and we feel ineffective, frankly. And often like we're sending people back out into dangerous situations with very little to no resources. Um, and so things like that, I think has also um, been, think have been highlighted, examples like that. I, don't know if that um, I would just like to add to that. This is Robbie that, um, um, oh God, now I forgot what I was gonna say. Oh yeah, the best practice guidelines are in place in the US for home to hospital transport. Um, they were created by a joint task force of midwives and, and physicians and um, of home birth midwives and physicians and nurse midwives. And they are, if, if all hospitals would follow those guidelines, then transports would go very smoothly. But many hospitals just kind of toss them in the trash and don't pay attention to them. So that leads to what I call fractured articulation, fractured articulations in transport, where the midwives information is not heeded, is not received, is not listened to, as, com uh, as contrasted with seamless articulations in which the midwives are actually allowed into the hospital to keep accompanying the laboring women, woman, giving her continuity of care. And um, it's really important that you as hospitals implement those guidelines and we need to see more progress in that area. Uh, thank you, Robbie. Um, I know we're up against time, but I wanted to ask one last thing of uh, Indra about your legislative efforts and how those might transfer to other states going forward. Maybe a minute or so, if you don't mind, but you seem like you're a succinct and clear speaker, so you can handle it. <laughs> oh, thank you for asking about that. Um, this last legislative session, we passed very ambitious set of bills in Colorado called the birth equity bills, which attempted to be a first pass at wrangling the components of the perinatal system so that they might be more equitable so that we could create some opportunities for better transfers, better collaboration, so that we could address some of those points of corruptibility and some of the economic inequities. And we do think of it as you know, a test uh, model legislation that could be uh, taken up in other states. And one of the kind of key lessons from that that I would offer to folks is to be more ambitious. Um, you know, I definitely didn't have it on the to-do list to you know, advance a law that had 25 different provisions. 
Um, it felt really scary and intimidating, but I think it changed the conversation because nobody was expecting that. Nobody was expecting something so ambitious, especially from a community-based organization, from you know the people who are not the usual suspects. And so then when all the usual suspects came to the table, it changed the dynamic, which I think is part of how we make the most of these portals. So um, that's a short introduction you know, we could spend a whole conference on it. 